Uh, the movie, uh, I, could, I could make some comments, I won't. Uh, you, you might have questions about it, but for Hollywood, I thought it was a, a pretty good movie in the sense that one thing I think it carried very well was basically the, the story of Apollo 13, but it is uh, people in trouble, and we certainly uh, were in trouble. And the team that came together, uh, actually a much larger team than uh, they could cast characters in the, uh, in the movie. So Ron Howard told me he couldn't afford the cast. <laughs> anyway, there was a lot of people involved in working as a team in mission control, in some cases uh, throughout uh, the, the country involved in helping to get us back. And we had a good, we had a good Hollywood ending. Uh, we, did get, we did get back. One of the things I was really impressed with, uh, and actually it was probably about two or three years ago, so it was over 40 years after the flight, I finally uh, got around to listening to some of the inner room loops. Uh, all, all the public heard was the Capcom talking to the capsule, talking to us back and forth. And, uh, but there was a, a number of loops for the very special things in the room that went to another room out of mission control along the hallway that was some of their backups, if you will, other than people that were also uh, knowledgeable about the systems. The unusual thing about our situation uh, <laughs> that uh, was, was different, uh, normally, we would say we can handle anything, and certainly when somebody like Gene France, uh, any, any flight director, or they would go for launch, they really had this team behind them that was uh, geared and honed and trained through a lot of simulations uh, to, to face what they had to do during the mission. Uh, so that credo that was created really by Hollywood scriptwriter Bayer is not an option, was kind of, kind of the way we, uh, we really felt. Uh, and, but the most things we had trained were what were called uh, possible failures, credible failures. And we had one that wasn't, uh, was credible, but the results uh, through all the FEMA, failure mean effects analysis and the design with reliability engineering said if you ever had an explosion, you were going to lose the vehicle and you'd lose the crew. So we kind of gave them a problem. We were sitting there still breathing. <laughs> and, uh, normally, for these, any of these problems you might incur, they had uh, set procedures. I know a lot of uh, British uh, air pilots uh, are here today, and it's, you know they operate with a checklist, a book, and it's steps. And even though you might be feel very confident and that knowledgeable about the airplane. And, I hope at least they still go through those uh, steps and get, get ready to take off or land. And we had similar things. And even Mission Control did. For most of the contingencies that applied to their systems, they could reach behind them and grab a book or even several books that would tell, help them uh, walk through what they had to do to mitigate that, uh, that problem. Well, there was no book for this set of problems we had. So they were really having an invented to fly. And as I listen to those voices now, uh, try to work through, and in the first case they had to do was, uh, and, and just, it really was real time conversation, it's really expressed the knowledge they had in their heads about the systems, the workings of the systems. And they desperately were trying to isolate the leak in the second oxygen tank. If we not had that leak in the second oxygen tank, we, we still would have not landed, but we'd have aborted still. We'd have come home, but fully powered up. And it would have been really a fairly normal mission, except the fact we didn't land. So they were working through things uh, in pretty desperate, shutting off uh, reactant valves, which is to flow to some of the fuel cells. They thought even the leak might be backwards in one of the fuel cells that wasn't producing the electricity at the time. And, uh, but they finally had to give up the ghost. And you could hear the, I knew, knew the people, and I could tell the uh, collection in their voices that they had lost the battle. They had run out of ideas. But Glenn Lunny, uh, the, the flight director at that point, uh, they shifted right in the middle of all of this. Uh, uh, Gene Krantz went off with his white team, and Glenn Lunny had come on with the maroon team. And he called them back to attention and said, hey, that we got to get this thing shut down and shut down fast because at the point uh, only one fuel cell was functioning 
and we were partially eating into the small entry batteries, the batteries we were going to need when we got back for entry. So anyway, it's just that quickly the voice changed, and now they had another problem though. The command module, the mothership we called it, was never supposed to be shut down in flight. So there was no procedure. They couldn't reach behind them and get the book on how to shut this thing down. And they had to do it in a graceful way to assure they didn't damage something in that process. But same thing went on now, just ad living with their backroom experts. They worked through a sequence that they knew would allow it to get shut off and get it shut off safely. So I, you know, I, was, I just, there was a story I had not uh, heard about. In fact, they took a lot of heat because, at least uh, Cy Lubegott, I think he talked here a, a while back, uh, Cy got, took a lot of heat because for 18 minutes, pretty much, he kept telling flight he thought it was an instrumentation problem. And, uh, and it, it really, obviously, was a real problem. And we did not accurately report things we saw out the window. We saw debris immediately, a big sea of debris outside. And it wasn't until Jim Lovell happened to see the machine. Behind you. It's not working. Can you hear me now? Yay! Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. We've had a problem. <laughs> hear me somewhat way in the back anyway. The acoustics ought to be pretty good in here. But at any rate, th this was a story, like I said, I had not uh, known about until I listened to those inner room voice tapes uh, after 40 years, uh, probably about two or three years ago. But at any rate, we did, we did get back, and I'd like to now, uh, if I could, have Josh start the video. And I'll do some narration of uh, that story with uh, what you see on film as well as a couple other stories. Got a countdown. This is, uh, this first portion is 13 minutes and it's uh, known as the Apollo 13 Quick Look. Saturn V was a rocket that took us to the moon. Uh, they're still on free left. They're on display at Kennedy, at Marshall, uh, in Huntsville, Alabama, and at Johnson Space Center. Uh, this thing, if you lay it on the side, where they are on display, they're laid on the sideways. Uh, that's virtually the length of a uh, football field. It's 365 feet plus uh, three feet, I think. We suited up in a building at Kennedy called the Operations and Checkout Building. We're breathing oxygen out of those canisters, preparing ourselves, uh, getting rid of nitrogen uh, in our bloodstream, because the capsules of uh, Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo all operated at 5 PSI, 100% oxygen. It saved weight and structure to operate at that lower pressure. We climbed aboard this uh, I think a converted milk wagon. NASA had uh, painted up fancy. We had benches we sat on and we could talk on the intercom to the soup techs as we went out to the launch pad. It's, it's kind of eerie the day you go out there for real because there's normally a lot of workers up and down that stack and the day you go, you got the two soup techs with you and there's four people waiting at the top to get you strapped in and uh, get the hatch closed and pressure checked and ready to go. I was one of those four people on both Apollo 8 and Apollo 11, uh, ready in the capsule for the crew. This is a firing room. This is not mission control. This is one of the firing rooms at Kennedy Space Center uh, that serviced uh, uh, all the Apollo launches. Same rooms, incidentally, uh, new, newer equipment. Uh, newer people uh, <laughs> were used, uh, some of them uh, were used to launch uh, the space shuttle through its uh, uh, launches. The 
The Saturn V uh, uh, got cranked up, uh, five engines producing seven and a half million pounds of thrust, and were held down for a little bit to assure you had stable uh, chamber pressure in the engines, and then those hold down arms are released. And it's hard to see now, it's all wiped out, but so you see it moves pretty slowly. It's, uh, if you were in a fighter airplane, and had it kicked in the afterburn to take off down the runway, it'd be a bigger kick in the pants than our launch. It's very slow uh, accelerating, mainly because the vehicle, even with seven and a half pounds push, seven and a half million, the vehicle weighed over six million pounds. And so it slowly went up, but it's burning tons of uh, oxidizer and propellant every second. So it got appreciably lighter as it went up, and so the acceleration or G's you felt increase to about four and a half G's. The, the oddest thing the, from a standpoint of flying fighter airplanes and uh, maneuvering, first of all, G's and fighters at the vintage I flew, uh, we pulled seven G's in combat maneuvering. Today, I think eight or nine in most fighters. Uh, we only got to four and a half G's on the first stage. That was the max G level. So it wasn't any big deal compared to all flying airplanes a lot. Uh, it did jerk you around quite a bit because we were, st were still not quite into the digital age. So the smoothness of the gimbals, of the gimbling of the engines for steerage weren't that as smooth as it would be if you did it today. And so it jerked us around a lot in the, in the cockpit because we remember we were way up on top of that stack. And when they gimbal, it's magnified when it gimbals way at the bottom of that thing. This scene is after we went around in Earth orbit uh, a couple of times and uh, mainly the checkout systems in that mothership make sure nothing had broken during launch. And then the uh, ground uh, started the third stage again. The third stage engine was fired again to accelerate us to escape velocity, about 25,000 miles an hour, which is headed as outbound. And that's where we are here. Jack Schweiger's taken over a control, and he's going back into dock with a probe that uh, connects to the upper hatch of the landing craft and his latches that can be fired when you dock that pull it tightly together and get an airtight seal and you can open up hatches then on either side and have a tunnel you can go between the two spacecraft and you'll see a picture of that later that's our third stage sitting off to the side there on this flight for the first time they vented it and oriented it the right way and used venting to give it a propulsive kick so it would impact the moon and thereafter, they did that on every flight. In other words, they used the big third stage to act like a meteorite hitting the moon to get data. Because on every flight we landed, we put seismometers. So you could collect substrata data on the moon. We had a TV show that, uh, that was uh, done about two days out. And it was really uh, at the end of that TV show, which was the end of the workday, that uh, the cryos were stirred and we had the explosion. So that ended up being a real long day. I think, uh, I think Jack and Jim were up uh, over about 20 hours. And I had already gone up and tried to get a cat nap in the uh, command, of other sh uh, command module, which was turned completely off. And after about four hours, I came back and relieved them. Here I'm uh, giving you a little tour. I was in the, uh, the mothership, which was shut down in the previous scenes, and I'm come floating down through the tunnel. One of the, one of the two most unusual things to me flying in space for the first time was being able to enjoy this zero-G effect. Uh, it's kind of euphoric. And you can play around, and here I am playing around with a camera cover, and yourself float around. You can see the people in Mission Control early, you saw a lot of smiling faces. These are the real people who are under a lot of pressure. Uh, I guess I told you, many I talked to, uh, some of them didn't even go home. They just laid down on the floor outside of Mission Control in the hallways when they'd be working through something and they'd get so fuzzy in their heads, they knew they weren't being effective. And they'd just go lay down and try to get a short sleep period and go back to work. Jim Lovell over there is rubbing his hands uh, because by this time, it took about a, almost a day, but it slowly cooled down because we went down to a very low, low power level, about 12 amps on the 30 volt system. So if you put that in the watts, it was like being at a 150 watt light bulb. It was like having two of them on. 
So we were not consuming much power, much below the design of the vehicle. And so it chilled down and froze the uh, water tanks in the mothership. In fact, the reason I can say birth, they were still frozen after entry when they recovered it on board the carrier. Uh, I respect we were probably in the mid-30s. We had no, no temperature gauge in the limb. We put on three sets of underwear, and Jim Lovell and I had on our lunar boots, the boots we were going to wear had we gone out on the moon. This is uh, Deke Slayton, one of the original seven, holding the canister they fabricated on the ground, again with even more people than showed on the film. Uh, in fact, they ran that again with a human subject in a chamber at Building 7 at Houston uh, to verify that the, what they had uh, put together worked before they gave us the procedure to do that. We went around the moon and after about two hours past the low point on the backside, we did a maneuver that really uh, got us in the box on our consumables. Uh, we did, a, in fact, that was the largest burn we did using the decent engine on the limb, the rocket engine. And that bought 10 hours off that return. So we were, we were back, uh, I, when I calculated at one point, Jim had asked me to, I had us running out of water. I had us in the box on electrical power. We had lots of oxygen. We had our two backpacks we were going to use on the moon to fill up, plus the emergency bottles on top of that. There's Jack uh, Schweiger to sleep in the back of the limb. Somebody uh, shot me asleep over on the left side of the uh, landing craft. After it got real cold, we just all three <coughs> stayed in the limb. Uh, we didn't go up to the what we call the ice box upstairs. <laughs> These, uh, that's Vance Brand, John Young on the other side you see there. Uh, see people in mission control plotting uh, data with a graph paper and a ruler. Uh, technology at that day, uh, biggest, a big computer on board, both uh, spacecraft, was one t about one-tenth of a megabyte. <laughs> one-tenth of a megabyte, now I didn't say gigabyte. <laughs> so uh, a lot of things were done pretty manual. That's Jim. Uh, they're holding up what I think is a package of frankfurters. <laughs> and Jack's spooning out what we call wet packs, some, uh, probably a thick beef stew. Uh, we couldn't heat the stuff, so we really gave up on the powdered uh, food entirely. And, and really, to even be reasonable, uh, you needed hot water. Uh, so we ate uh, the, that, what they were holding, and plus we ate a lot of cookie cubes, bread cubes, and peanuts. We had a separate part of the pantry that had snacks. So, that's the uh, California Baja you saw there as we came in the entry. Very unusual in entry, uh, we got rained on. Uh, a little light rain as we hit because the water separator in the limb, that was the only vehicle operating, it wasn't, even, uh, it wasn't designed to operate at the temperature we were in the limb, much less this other ship. So water had built up in the command module uh, Jack and I had to wipe off the instrument panel when we went to power it up to see the instruments. Water was covered and everything, and it was behind the panels, and when we hit G's coming in, that water uh, cascaded out on us. But we made it back, and uh, almost, uh, we want to call it a second miracle. Uh, if you looked at the Apollo mission report at uh, uh, one of the appendices, and they had a number of appendices in that uh, report, covering uh, entry and entry landings. Uh, we had the second most accurate splashdown of the program. <laughs> Only Apollo 10 did better. We were, uh, the, we were retrieved by the uh, Iwo Jima aircraft carrier. It had actually been, uh, it, was, it came off a combat mission in Vietnam. So it was coming back through and uh, uh, they had, did have trained Navy SEALs brought on board that were uh, trained to handle the, uh, the pickup, to safe the capsule. They actually open the hatch. You don't open the hatch. When they're done with their uh, getting everything set up, they knock on the window and, and uh, they have a tool B, it was called, that would, could un unlock the hatch and let you out. Here, uh, people in mission control are celebrating. Uh, that's Tom Stafford. France that are left, that's Charlie Duke. It was over here, and uh, Ken Manningly there shaking hands. It was just here, I guess, the last time. Uh, unusually, they had no splashdown party because everybody was so tired, they went home. <laughs> and 
and uh, so we were a crew also uniquely got to go to our own splashdown party that was held two weeks later. <laughs> That last the phone tie-up you saw as they were talking was to President Nixon, who uh, actually flew uh, Air Force One out uh, with our, our wives and uh, to meet us at Hawaii. Following that, I backed up uh, John Young as a backup commander on Apollo 16, and when I went into that, I had uh, Bill Pogue as the command module pilot and Jerry Carr as the lunar module pilot. And <laughs> You need to get the sound off, please. To resemble a Japanese. Yeah. And uh, I, I had hoped uh, we would get to go fly 19. At that time, that was the last mission. And we were in training about five months, and they canceled 18 and 19, so I lost that chance. I'd gone off to Harvard Business School, and when I came back, I went into the Orbiter Project Office. I eventually wanted to get into program management. While there, I was sport flying with an operation that did air shows. We inherited some aircraft. They, we got them cheap from 20th Century Fox. They had used them in making of the film Toro, 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 Attack on Pearl Harbor. And with these aircraft, we would stage the opening act, which is virtually that. And we coupled that with a B-17 and a P-40 Tommy Hawk and a little rat race and a lot of smoke and fire on the ground with explosives as the opening act. One day I was ferrying the aircraft and I had an engine fail at 300 feet and I got around to what I thought was a dirt field which really turned out to be the start of a housing project. <laughs> and this was a, uh, you know, there were no houses yet but they started digging ditches. And this was a fixed gear airplane. I couldn't re re retract the landing gear. And one of uh, the wheels went into a ditch and flipped, the wing dug in it rotated over upside down backwards. And I was trapped for a while to get out and received burns over 65% of my body. Went into the University of Galveston, uh, Tech University of Texas Hospital at Galveston. And this was incidentally, the reason I carried this, not to, uh, not because it's gruesome, uh, they, but because to tell you it's another teamwork story. With a goal, the goal of getting back to flight status, I had a medical team of a mix of the, the Shrine Doctors, the Children's Burn Shrine Institute, who serviced the adult ward, the burn ward at the University of Texas. And they were gonna do the, the grafting and that kind of business. But yet my day-to-day -day was serviced by University of Texas staff and uh, getting through that. I was in the hospital three months, and it really took uh, uh, 14 months with physical therapy. I had a bind in one knee, one elbow, and my wrist. Uh, that I had to work through to get back to flight status. Uh, the only, we did one thing different too. Uh, we worried about, uh, I had uh, data graphs all the way around my legs, and normally they'd put a pin through your ankle and hoist your legs up when they grafted to keep you from having a pressure point for about five days. And uh, rather than do that, we worried about if I left a gap in the bones, I'd have problem flying with the pressure differential with the gaps that maybe left, the voids. So the suit techs actually worked up a pair of sandals with Velcro on the bottom and built a board at the end of the bed so I could just grab my foot and feed into the Velcro and that's the way I got away from that. But uh, so the accident was in 1973. In 1976, I left the, uh, the uh, project office, the Arbiter Project Office where I was working. To go back to the astronaut office, I was named to command <coughs> crew one of two crews that were designated for the approach and landing test at Edwards in 1977. Uh, Gordo Fullerton and I were crew one, Joe, uh, Joe Engel and Dick Truly were crew two. So really only four of us got to fly on top of the 747 in this uh, program. There were eight flights. Uh, Gordo and I flew five of the flights. Uh, Joe and Dick flew three. This is uh, uh, the one flight I'll show. This was the day, the first time we were going to release it. We flew uh, three flights to perfect the launch point, really, to worry about where, uh, with, the, with the load cell data we had from the stanchions, we knew if we got to this point of separated, we'd go straight up. We wouldn't drift back into the 747 tail, which we worried about. Uh, Gardo and I climbed aboard, as you saw, before dawn. 
and taxied out, and we're cocked up, you saw, so we're generating lift for the 747. Very unusually, when you're in the orbiter up there, uh, looking out any window, the side windows, the front windows, you cannot see the 747. So it's sort of magic, you know, it's taxiing out, it takes off, uh, they got a magic carpet that slowly uh, can climb up, and it got up to about 30,000 feet with us on top to a, uh, set up a, just flew a big rectangular pattern up from north from Edwards Air Force Base and back around uh, to get set for the right point. Uh, Fitz Fulton was the guy flying the 747. Tom McMurtry was the other pilot. Uh, Skip Guidry and uh, Vic Harden were the other two uh, flight engineers, four people on board the 747. He pushed over and uh, at time Fitz would call launch ready. I pushed the button that fired the pyrotechnics and we went, as you saw, cleanly up and away. In reality, we dropped the 747 because we were generating lift, and when we cut free, they lost that lift. So they had a tendency to go on that, uh, pitch over, go down further, <coughs> and we went up and away. Quite unusual in the high desert behind uh, Los Angeles there, uh, we got these uh, vortex uh, streams off the uh, wingtips. The, the air went, it was just the right moisture that day to give that uh, nice picture as we came up and away. Uh, like any first flight, you don't do too much daring. Uh, we flew basically a, uh, initially <coughs> and pushed over to get uh, pre-launch, what we call pre-flare pre speed, and uh, did, a, did a fake, a fake pull-out, if you will, to make sure I could get to uh, zero sync rate and then push back over. Flew a box pattern, basically just a downwind base leg, and then on a final, uh, we landed. Uh, the the pre-flare speed was about 270 knots, and you normally started to pull out at about 2,000 feet above the ground. Uh, you waited till late to put down the landing gear because they constituted drag, so you didn't want to put them down too early and lose too much speed. You tried to maintain a little excess speed. These are called high energy approaches that were perfected during the uh, X-15 program. So, so you don't have engines, so basically your excess speed is uh, what you have to play with to uh, really uh, modulate and, and, and work your uh, final landing. We worried a lot about ground effect. It's the one thing you cannot uh, find out in a tunnel, a wind tunnel. Uh, all the other parameters you can, but when ground effect is basically how the aircraft is going to behave when you get within about one wing width of the ground. And uh, we had uh, dispersed cases we considered that would be a balloon case. We'd get in it to the cushion and it'd balloon you up, which is not a good thing, again, because you run out, might run out of airspeed before you get it back in the ground. And the other case we call vacuum sweep, where it would tend to suck you into the ground with a harder landing. Turned out the vehicle was uh, natural, unnatural. It just was really, if you were set up right and scooting along pretty low, you could almost just let go of everything and it would land. It's a nice cushioning, uh, right cushioning effect. But at any rate, if I uh, back up now a little bit, uh, again, I, Apollo to me uh, was, a very, it was a very unique program. Uh, there was a lot of things that sort of aligned to allow that to happen and be uh, properly uh, backed uh, through uh, really national interest, uh, through Congress, uh, the administration, uh, John F. Kennedy's declaration, to be properly supported and funded uh, to make, make that program happen. Uh, the uh, things that people considered, they studied afterwards and say, why did Apollo happen? Because obviously it hadn't happened really since. And uh, there, were, there were several things. One was they thought, well, one of the things was the threat, the threat in the Cold War and the Soviets, and they launched Sputnik and then the Gagarin. So there was conceived a, a gap in technology. So this was chosen uh, then by the right leadership, uh, John F. Kennedy, who wanted to uh, dec uh, have do something that declared what the technology capability was of the U.S. And I understand they offered a number of projects, not just Apollo. And because uh, I don't think personally he was a space fan or, or had not studied astronomy or 
but uh, he looked at this as the right thing uh, to do the job in that regard of what he wanted to do to express uh, America's capability in that sense. And so it was turned on that way. Another thing uh, you have to have, and that's been a continuing problem, I think, beyond is the, there cannot be something going on that draws on large amounts of your national budget. And of course, that's what ended up canceling 18 and 19 was the uh, cost of the Vietnam War and the expanding budget to support that. And the last thing is you, uh, you can dream about doing something, uh, but you better have the technology to be able to pull it off. So you had to have those, all that kind of stuff aligned to make it happen. And we've really not had that alignment since. Uh, space shuttle was turned on. I was in the orbiter project office, I mentioned. And the first three years of shuttle, we got half the funding of our program plan. So when you've got a program situation like that, and similar to what they had they're facing today, uh, you have to try to make do the whole schedule. You're always trying to hold schedule. So you start taking content out of the program in various ways. In our case, we deleted, uh, for instance, a backup enterprise. We had two enterprises. And we just cut one out, which is not a good thing to do in a test program. You'd like to have something in case something didn't turn out exactly right. We turned one test article, OB-99, uh, into a flight vehicle by only doing a load test up to 80% loads and mathematically extrapolating. So OB-99 became Challenger the orbiter that later exploded on, uh, as you know, on launch. So that way we bought another airframe without having to build one. We used the structural test article. We deleted a, a lot of test articles. So there was great risk. And finally we ran out of uh, ideas of what we could throw out. And now that what happens is if you're inadequately funding, then schedule's gonna go. Uh, that happened, but another compounding factor was the early tile problem. So we missed the first launch date uh, by two years on shuttle from our original plan. Interestingly, uh, approach a landing test, we only missed that first flight by two weeks from a schedule that had been created uh, about uh, four years before. So it held, but it was not as complicated a vehicle uh, and it wasn't as complicated complicated mission, obviously, is uh, getting to Harvard. Uh, one of the things that was reflected also uh, in a different way, uh, and so it's a, it's a worrisome thing for NASA on a major program when, they change, when you change administrations. In other words, one administration has turned on the program. In the case of shuttle, it was President Nixon. And now about the time we were getting ready to first fly Enterprise, uh, President Jimmy Carter had come in. And it was pretty obvious uh, NASA and space program wasn't on his top 10 priority list and what he had campaigned for. And in fact, he canceled the B-1 bomber program about two months after he came into office, which to us was an indication of his feelings, maybe about aerospace in general. It was reflected by the ground crew in a, in a different way. That uh, morning when we climbed aboard Enterprise and got ready to go up the ladder to get in our operating seats, uh, there were two Polaroid pictures on each side of the ladder and it was these characters in blue suits like we were wearing and they had a helmet on. Actually, they borrowed <coughs> the suit techs, I'm sure, provided they had our helmets on, uh, the visor down and a mask sort of draped so you couldn't tell who they were. They were sitting on this huge uh, sweeper, kind of sweeps big city streets. And in the hangar, and the saying said, if you follow this up, this is your next job. <laughs> so, so the workers were worried, worried about it too, about their jobs. Uh, it would have taken us a year and a half, two years to regroup uh, had we uh, crashed uh, Enterprise. So uh, they, they were worried about that. And of course, we were all worried about that in light of the changing administration that that could have been the end of the program. Uh, there's not been anything the same, same way since. Uh, space Station uh, had to limp along with the funding uh, less than the program plan for several years. In fact, in 1987, 
had one vote shifted in our House of Representatives, had one vote shifted, there would be no space station today. So they, that, and that's another problem. I think ASA does it better, and I know Japan the same way, and, uh, and Canada. Normally they fund whatever the program plan is for the years, they commit to that with some reserve, generally at you know, 15, 20%. And the program manager, and, and they're allowed to run with that until they have to come back and show an overrun, and then they make a decision to either fund more money or cancel it. Uh, but in America, you have to live with a budget year to year. And it's never what you hoped it would be. Fortunately, you have things uh, like Artemis, where you program the work scope and critical path and all of that. And so you, you can juggle pretty, but every, every year, basically, you're creating a new program plan. Uh, to keep moving. So that's a, de a delicate uh, issue that you face in trying to do a major program in America. Uh, I, if I look back just from my personal uh, standpoint, I, I just feel very uh, fortunate with my total career. Uh, beyond NASA, in 1971, nine, 1979, I joined the Grumman Corporation. Uh, I headed space programs. I had a number of uh, initial projects with some classified DOD programs with satellite, and I under me the manufacturing of the shuttle wings for the remaining shuttles that were being uh, built, and uh, I got to go start a service company for Grumman, a subsidiary company, and ended up when Northrop and Grumman merged after 17 years, I was running uh, two subsidiary companies, and I inherited the one Northrop had. Uh, a wide variety of uh, business, uh, across the Defense Department, across other government agencies, Internal Revenue Service, EPA, uh, had the post office uh, training facility. Uh, a lot of Defense Department though, with air, more aircraft maintenance and uh, base support type work. Uh, so I've had a very uh, lucky, uh, interesting life, particularly uh, in view of being around at the right time for Apollo. I just happened to magically accidentally end up in a flying career. Uh, I was going to be a journalist like uh, Kate here, writing away on her, <laughs> on her record here. Uh, I was going to be a journalist for the first two years of college. And the Korean War is what turned me. I went and decided to go into service and uh, ended up in the Naval Aviation Cadet Program, became a pilot and loved flying. So that put me in the right path from there to go get an engineering degree and become a test pilot for NASA for seven years, seven and a half years before I went into the uh, astronaut program. So I'm saying I was lucky because I just arrived at the right time with the right experience, background, uh, to be qualified to apply and be accepted in that uh, Apollo program. Uh, there are many others uh, today, and you could look, and a lot of people have those same credentials relatively today, but there's no program. So I, uh, I truly feel very uh, fortunate, uh, very lucky to have had the chance. Anyway, thank you. Maybe have a, a minute or two just for Fred to catch himself because obviously uh, 45 minutes uh, of some very entertaining stories is always sort of is a bit of a strain, but uh, it's always nice to sort of pick out on each of these occasions how something new always comes out. And certainly for me, sort of listening to various parts of the building, you know, I've, I've picked up quite a few extra things, you know, during the the period of uh, of this afternoon. So what we're going to do now is go through a period of questions and answers. Obviously you'll get the questions and Fred will hopefully give you the answers. Uh, we'll have sort of mics sort of going around. Hopefully they've got them switched on. So that uh, obviously we will select as and when obviously people want to have a go. Put the lights on because obviously Fred would like to be able to see who he's uh, addressing his answers to. Okay, so. Who's going to be the brave person first of all? 
You have to make sure that the mics are in the right place. So obviously we'll go over that one, that one side there first. Keep going. Well, thank you for uh, coming this weekend, sir. It's been a wonderful weekend. Um, question I recently asked Sai Liebergott. Um, everybody knows about the oxygen explosion on the way out to the moon, but not a lot of people know about the potentially serious problem you had just after launch. And I'm talking about the pogo effect. Could you tell me how bad that was and, and how it affected your operation in the command module? Okay. Uh, what he, the pogo <laughs> effect he's talking about was on the second <clears throat> stage, which had five engines. They were different. They were F1. Uh, engines on the uh, first stage, these were smaller, uh, the J-2, incidentally, which is today, the J-2X is being tested at Stennis Space Center right now for a possibly use on the SLS, uh, upgraded. Those were 200,000 pound engines. Uh, they've upgraded now to be about 280,000 pounds. But at any rate, the center engine failed. And the reason it failed, this pogo effect, is a, a fluid flow instability. So it ended up basically chugging, if you want to look at it that way. But the chugging was of a degree that uh, it was uh, causing a, 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 what's called a pogo effect, like a, being on a jackhammer. It really wasn't that severe in the capsule. It was not, uh, we, we could feel this chattering. And th then the light came on. We had an array of five lights and that center light went out, which told us that engine had quit. I talked to the, uh, Dick Smith, the program manager at Marshall later. He, he said it probably wouldn't have taken too many more cycles before it would have broke the structure. It was sitting on a cross structure in that center stage and would have had a much bigger bang right there. Uh, the, the critical issue then was, though, to get to orbit, we had to use uh, the, the, just the four engines burning and burn much longer, including uh, the third stage portion of that, because it was ignited uh, then after you separated the second stage to really get you fully in orbit. So it consumed more fuel than normally it would. We had the longest time of launch to insertion of any of the flights. And, but it didn't take long. The people on the ground did the calculations on the propellant and figured we, we had margin, enough margin, I don't know how many seconds, but enough margin to ignite it again and, and make that maneuver uh, using the engine to accelerate to 25,000 miles an hour and uh, get on our way. So I, it really, it, it, toward a sense of the mission, it had no, really no effect. Hey, thank you very much. The next question, please, Eddie. Fred, I believe you had a little trick you used to play when coming from the LEM to the mothership, which when the uh, real explosion took place initially, the crew thought it was you playing, playing up again. Would you care to explain yeah, that, what it was and how it worked? Yeah, the LEM, and this, this was not a trick I played uh, just doing it on my own. Through the LEM activation, our shutdown normally where we were in a, on a test run or something, there was a valve called the repress valve. And when you cycle that valve, it made a bang. <laughs> yeah, which, in a, in a, if you can imagine, we're in metal structures, uh, it tended to echo and magnify maybe who, who heard it, what they thought it might be. So, uh, no, Jim thought I'd played that trick in both the chamber test and uh, one other test on the ground not informed them that I was fixing to throw the repress valve. Uh, so Jim, I think, was hoping uh, that's, uh, that's what I had done again. Okay, and the next question, please. Uh, yeah, on down here, please. Thanks, Josh. Good afternoon. Um, you were Capcom on the Apollo 14 EVA-2. I always thought that must have been a bittersweet experience in a way because it should have been you up there. Could you share your thoughts on that? Thank you. Right. I, I uh, volunteered. I was, would not normally have been a Capcom on 14, uh, but I volunteered uh, to do that 
and I, I lined up with the team that was going to be on, on duty at that time. I was the Jerry Griffin's goal team. So I uh, that has worked the normal sequences through the mission. These teams cycle as four teams actually, every mission, four flight directors. And they actually have three flight directors uh, in their teams that are normally dedicated to, I'll call it, the real activity times, um, launch, entry, et cetera. And the fourth team is kind of a floater that fills in here and there to give some relief and more, maybe more rest time to the other teams. So I lined up with Jerry's team, and that put me, as you said, right in so I knew I'd cover the second EVA. And I really thought I, they, they landed at the same spot uh, from our own. They had basically the same traverse uh, that they were going to do that I had trained to do. All the same kind of sampling uh, protocol and special samples they had to collect. About the only thing new they had was this little thing they had to drag behind them, which at times ended up being an impediment trying to go up the slope up to Cone Crater. But at any rate, I figured I might be able to help, uh, help them, and uh, they're executing uh, that, that EBA. Uh, yeah, it was bittersweet. It was bittersweet every time somebody landed. <laughs> Not just 14. <laughs> okay, thank you. And the next question, just next to you, please. Thanks. Thank you very much for coming, first of all. Mm. Once, uh, during 13, once you realized uh, that the mission original goals were going to be scrubbed, meaning that there was going to be no landing, uh, and, and once the gravity of the situation dawned on you, how did you feel? How did feeling that you were not going to be on the moon contrast with the gravity of the situation back then? I guess you're asking me what were my emotions or feelings? Uh, That's right. There, there was uh, somewhat of a, a, a change as time went by, but initially at the point of the explosion, and I was still in the landing craft, we had done that TV show, and we had done a show and tell. I had pulled out some equipment we knew had not been talked about in previous flights. And I was still putting away stuff we had pulled out of storage. And that happened. And when, by the time I, I drifted up pretty shortly up the tunnel and got into my right seat, which had where the problem was. I had all the electrical systems, the cryogenics, the fuel cells, and communications. And so when I looked at the meters uh, scan just very quickly, it was clear uh, we had lost oxygen tank two because three meters were down on the bottom of the gauges. Uh, for tank two, which is, you know, you wouldn't consider you that unlucky to have three sensors fail all at the same time. And so I knew we'd lost that tank and uh, we were going to, without reference in mission rules, I knew that was an abort. So I was uh, sick to my stomach, just uh, not my stomach. I knew we had, the show was over, we were going to come home. And it was not life threatening. I thought we still had that second tank, tank one. And it took a little time for it to manifest itself that it had some uh, slow leak and would eventually uh, lose it. By that time, we got very busy with the ground and trying and giving them a lot of readings, uh, trying some uh, switch and system changes. They figured out, well, this may stop the leak. So we worked for that uh, for about an hour and a half before Jim and I knew the was all over. They had run out of ideas, and then we went to the lunar module to power it up and left Jack alone. Uh, you know, Mission Control, I don't know if Cy told that, but basically for almost 18 minutes, they didn't think it was a real problem. I uh, thought it was instrumentation, and it was rightfully so, not from just our not reporting, but the way the uh, warning lights came on, uh, you have a panel called Caution Warning. It's probably that big. And it has uh, lights, uh, some are red, which are warning lights, which means that's something bad. <laughs> and then you have some of them that are kind of an orange-yellow look, cast. And those are caution lights, which also are bad, but not as bad. <laughs> and we had seven of those on at once, plus the uh, master alarm, plus a blue computer restart light. And the trouble that uh, fake does out, too, is that they were across systems that were not interrelated. Uh, the vehicle was a very simple vehicle. Everything was stovepipe for a system. There was no integration through the computer. The only thing the computer did, and you know, I told you it wasn't much memory, was it get, did guidance, nav, and control. That was all of it. Everything else for all systems was manual. So uh, there was no way 
uh, a problem even with a fuel cell um, would affect the uh, RCS system. There's no way. They're not interconnected in any way. But yet we had this cascade of lights and cross systems that shouldn't happen at once. So that was the confusion factor, and more so for the ground, because they had not felt the big bang and the vehicle motion caused initially and uh, had seen the debris out the window, which we didn't report. So they, for 18 minutes, thought this was not a real, real problem. We were going to work around the caution warning electronics assembly. They figured it was a card, a shard and a card in that box, and uh, we'd just get around it somehow and press on with the mission. Uh, the before Jack showed up in the limb, it was over two hours. So again, at no time in here was it like you had lost control of a car and you're about to skid off the road or something. It was a very slow, evolving. Uh, situation that mainly was fighting all the way to uh, try to get to a point where you could buy some time and, uh, and eventually uh, of course they ran out of time and we ended up losing the vehicle. So now it was just out of posture to live in LFM for four days versus the two days it was intended to be uh, active. But I, I really uh, felt remorse, obviously, uh, I've saved for, for mostly just for missing the landing. Okay, thanks. Uh, next question, please. Uh, let's see. Yeah, let's come down here, please. Thanks. Okay. Uh, during the mission, was there any time that you thought that you weren't really going to make it? It was really all over. No, we had, we had no discussion. What Jim did after we did the very first the use of the uh, Lem decent engine, it wasn't too long a burn. Uh, we call when we fire the engine, we call that a burn. And uh, we, it wasn't a, a big burn. It was done all automated through the computer. And Jim asked me to calculate consumables, oxygen, water, electricity. And I didn't think, and Jim didn't think, of uh, LIOH uh, cartridges that you know, cleanse the air of CO2. We didn't think of that as a consumable, which was the most critical, as it turned out. But anyway, I calculated, uh, did not calculate oxygen. I knew right off the bat we had more oxygen because we had tanks in the, in the decent stage, acid stage, plus we had two full backpacks, the things we were going to use when we landed on the moon to go outside. Uh, so I knew we had an abundance of oxygen for the time. At that time, it would have been a 150-something hour flight. Uh, we ended up cutting that off by 10 hours. <laughs> then uh, the next thing that uh, I figured and it made it in the box was uh, electrical power. We had uh, four batteries, 1,600 amp hours in the uh, ascent and the descent stage, and a couple of those batteries in the ascent stage. And uh, it, it, it made it, but doesn't have a lot of margin, but it made it at an assumed power down that I did uh, just looking at the books we had and the, the uh, amperage per component, I uh, figured an 18, figured what I need to limp along was about 18 amps on a 30 volt system. And by using that uh, consumable uh, rate, I, I made it. Uh, water I ran out of, it's primarily water for cooling. Uh, even though we got still chilly, you had to provide something for the electronics through their cold plates. And it ran out about five hours before the then, what would then been the entry point. I didn't worry about that even because Apollo 11, uh, we had the crew turn off the water valve. And we watched their limb die. It was, a, it was the only one that we left in orbit. Maybe Apollo 10 we did too, I think. Later limbs were actually uh, deorbited to again use to make a meteorite impact. But we turned off the water valve and we watched each component that failed in the various systems. And the first critical component failed at about eight hours. So I figured I had a little margin on water. But you know, it's like, it's like anything when you do that or even uh, uh, fighter squadrons hours in, you, uh, you, you, all, you, don't, you got no guarantee you're gonna get back on any given day. And uh, so normally you're planning there is before you fly. Uh, in fact, I had, Jerry Carr was my designee in the same way in the squadron. She normally had a designee. And before we uh, launched, Jerry came to the house 
and I showed him where all the papers were, insurance papers, and things he might need to get out and help the wife and family uh, should I not make it back. And it's kind of a traditional thing, again, you're doing a fighter squad, you'll have a dozen B uh, that you'll have to take care of you uh, if you don't make it. And uh, so, you know, you got, you got no guarantee on any flight, really. All right, thank you very much. And the next question, please. Uh, uh, sorry, that's to your, to your left, please. Uh, no, on back row, back row, sorry. Uh, hi, Fred. Um, I'm studying aerospace engineering. Do you have any tips or advice for someone who wants to become an astronaut? <laughs> you're, uh, you are an aeronautical engineer or you're planning? I'm still, I'm two years done. Okay, uh, good luck to you. I, I assume uh, you, you would uh, look to Rolls Royce or uh, uh, obviously you have aerospace major companies. All I can say is aerospace, the, the only problem with aerospace uh, and depending on which of the industries is it, it cyclically, if it's heavy into defense, uh, has ups and downs. And uh, there's no way around it, uh, you know, wars drive the defense budgets and peacetime takes defense budgets down. So if you were in a, a, a business that didn't have a commercial content like Rolls Royce, uh, you'd have to worry about what defense budgets did because they're cyclic. Somebody said they almost follow the cycle of the locusts uh, in America. But at any rate, uh, that's the nature of the aerospace business. Uh, but obviously, if you're well qualified, you do good on the job, uh, you do, at least for the non-exempts, uh, you, as you have to go through a RIF, we call it reduction in force, uh, you uh, work normally, we work through a board of actually evaluating appraisals and the, the person's ability and, uh, and worthwhile. And you, you use that judgment in how you lay people off. You don't just do it on seniority. Okay, next question please. Now I've all on to this side. Josh, can you go into the corner please? Uh, yeah, my question's to do with, was there any concerns on the structure in firing the LEM rocket for, um, in terms of the connections between the command module and, and the LEM and using it in that configuration? Uh, and also, uh, clearly in the film, there's portrayals of a lot of you guys being thrown around. Um, did that happen in reality at all during the flight? Uh, well, one thing that the reason it was ne it was not a concern is Apollo 9. Apollo 9, that uh, Jim McDivitt, uh, in fact, he, he uh, decided to stay with the LIM, the lunar module first flight. Uh, if he had not, uh, he would have flown Apollo 8, and Pete Conrad and uh, and that crew would have really been the first crew to land on the moon. Uh, but he decided to stay with the LIM because he had, had a, a lot of investment through the early first first development of that first limb that was going to carry it through to orbit. And they shook they shook it out. I mean, they, they did a number of firings, both with the descent engine, they staged, and did an ascent engine firing. So they, uh, and they did, and they did it, made it, uh, with the command module. So it really, uh, it, with, the, with the automated system, it was smooth. Uh, now, in our case, uh, we didn't have computers for the last two uh, burns we did, uh, which were highly exaggerated in the movie. I don't know if the movie, uh, they showed us doing this burn using the stopwatch to run the engine on and off, and the earth going up and down in the window. If you look at the data, we did two burns, very short burns, uh, about 18 uh, seconds on one, about 21. One using the decent engine, one using four jet RCS, the 100 pound thrusters on the, on the limb. And we did not deviate even one degree in any of three axes. <laughs> so that was another, we went under the head a little bit. We were out of control. <laughs> Incidentally, uh, the, uh, Jim had roll and I had pitch. The greatest deviation, 0.9 degrees, was in Jim's accident. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Your man here, please, Josh. Wondering forward. Yep. 
Do you believe in aliens? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. The, Do you the, believe the, in aliens? <laughs> have I seen an alien? <laughs> uh, no, I. Huh? Do you believe in aliens? Oh, do I believe in aliens? I believe it's possible. Uh, have, have you studied any astronomy? Uh, it seems like every time we look further, a uh, space telescope uh, has done what's called a deep space view and perched it in one direction to look continually, I remember, for a long time. And they saw more and more galaxies way out there we had never do were there. So it seems like every time we find something we look a little further, there's more out there. Each galaxy has uh, 100 plus million stars. Uh, many stars are like our sun. So statistically, you'd have to think there's life somewhere out there. Just, you know, I, I put it in a different way. I, I say I do not have a big enough ego <laughs> that I think the Creator put that all there just so I could go out at night and see a beautiful sky. <laughs> I think there's got to be more to it than that. Uh, but, but have we seen them, or is there one? No, I, some people believe it. <laughs> seen them or have come down here and landed with flying saucers or captured people and put them on board and <laughs> questioned them or did something. Uh, I don't believe, I do not believe that. <laughs> okay, thank you. We'll just go for two more questions. If you have the first one here, please, thanks. Uh, Mr. Hayes, you mentioned the Falcon <coughs> movie. Uh, at one point in that movie, there is a kind of argument, a fight between Jack Swigert and you. As I heard later, it's, uh, it was some Hollywood thing. But can you tell us something about the way three people in that dangerous situation live in the current situation and what the role of uh, mission commander Jim Lovell was? Well, uh, <coughs> first of all, it was uh, not true. Uh, if I had not been down uh, putting away stuff in the limb and been in my normal right seat position, I would have been the one to throw the switches to stir the cryo. There was nothing you could look at on the instrument panel that would tell you you're going to have an electric chart when you threw that switch. Uh, so no, there was n never an argument. Uh, I, I think uh, you know, through the training you go through, which was a very intense six months, and really Jim and I, uh, Lovell and I, had been in two crews before. He was the prime crew on eight, but as a backup you worked together literally every day. And then Jim Lovell and, and uh, Ken were the backup on 11 for another six month cycle. So you're just very intimately close to the, the people that you have around you. Uh, the skills are uh, pretty much spread by your uh, training and your knowledge base. For instance, Jack uh, couldn't apply a lot of utility in the limb because he didn't know the limb. He had never been in the limb before in his life until in flight. He hadn't even been in the landing craft on the ground. He was the command module expert. Uh, so you, you kind of were trained to do your component of what you trained. You basically, uh, the way we trained was uh, the command module pilot had to know the whole command module. He had to operate it alone because he was going to be in lunar orbit, but also he may have to come home alone. If somebody didn't get off the moon, he was going to have to come back and do the entry on his own. Uh, and limb, we both knew the whole limb. For a similar reason, if one guy had, had a suit pop on the surface, one guy was going to have to come home alone with the limb. So that's the way we trained and, and spread the breadth of what we, uh, the knowledge uh, we would need to cover. Okay, and the, the last question, please. Jo you just come down here, Josh. Oh, it's be just behind you. <coughs> uh, Fred, you, you talked about hearing the, the full mission tapes only three years ago. And I wondered if, um, A, it affected the way you look back at the mission and and B whether there was anything there that maybe didn't tie in with your memory from 40 years ago how it changed your feelings about what happened uh, no when I when I listened to the tapes so uh, what it just uh, made me want to applaud because uh, they really handled a uh, real-time an ad lib had to be ad lib situation solely on what was in their brains <coughs> It was not a procedure to go grab, uh, so it really, and, and, and that was real time. Normally when you have a problem that can't be solved with grabbing one of those books, 
uh, in this time, they handed off as a chit at the discrepancy report to the MUR, the Mission Evaluation Room, which is actually in another building, building 45, Mission Control is in building 30 at Johnson. And there there's a whole room full of more in-depth experts. And I mentioned earlier that uh, the nature of that room, that was a sign, was a sign over double doors going in that room. And the sign said, God is welcome, all others bring data. <laughs> and, uh, but, but behind them, they had the communication links to the, all the prime contractors, who in turn could call on their subcontractors. So you really had an army uh, to call on. The army was pretty big, and that was one of the complaints I had for Ron about how, just how many people were involved, uh, directly and even indirectly. Uh, at the peak of Apollo, which was before Apollo 11 flew, uh, we were at over 400,000 people on the program. Mm -hmm. And every state in the United States, except one of the Dakotas, if you went down to the Peace Park vendors, and uh, by the time we flew 13, we're probably down to about a quarter of a million people on the program. So there was a vast brain trust, and the program drew some really talented people. The challenge drew people. The challenge of uh, making this thing and, and making it happen and go to the moon, it brought us uh, some people probably could have earned more money in a different way, uh, but they wanted to be a part of this. So we, we had a lot of talent to, to put to it. Ladies and gentlemen, Fred Hayes. Uh, thank you very much, everybody.